Hello and welcome. I'm Tom Burgess Watson. You're watching W News, broadcasting live from the Al Arabiya headquarters. These are our top stories. Lebanon's health minister, Firas Abiyad, says that at least 51 people have been killed. 223 others have been injured today as a result of Israeli airstrikes. Israeli media reports that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is convening a cabinet meeting after the military intercepted heavy missile fired by Hezbollah towards a civilian area of Tel Aviv. Plus, we will have for you all the latest on the US election as Trump's campaign says that US intelligence warned of Iranian assassination threats and Kamala Harris receives the endorsement of a top US Muslim voter organization. Welcome. We begin in Lebanon, where the country's health minister, Firas Abiyad, says that at least 51 people have been killed, 223 others have been injured today as a result of Israeli airstrikes. Well, Israel has intensified its bombardment of Lebanon, conducting new strikes in both northern and southern regions. Well, in one significant development, Hezbollah announced that a, uh, this morning that it has targeted a Mossad headquarters in the suburbs of Tel Aviv with a ballistic missile. That marks the first use of this type of weapon since the cross-border hostilities escalated on the 8th of October. Well, today the Lebanese Foreign Minister Abdallah Bouhabib spoke about the situation in the country and his hopes for intervention. Well, he suggested that Washington had not shown the kind of support that he had hoped for. Uh, it was not strong, it is not promising, and it would not solve the Lebanese problem. We need to solve. We can't. Uh, we can't continue like this in the situation that we are in today. And we're still hoping the United States is the only country that can really make a difference in the Middle East and with regard to Lebanon. The Lebanese foreign minister speaking there. Well, for the latest from Lebanon, we can cross to Beirut and speak to journalist Hannah McCarthy. Hannah, uh, thanks for joining us once again here. Uh, 51 people reported to have been killed today by Israeli airstrikes in Lebanon. Uh, reports of airstrikes near the coastal town of Biblos as well. Just talk us through Wednesday's main developments, if you will. Sure. So, I mean, Israeli bombardments have continued uh, in South Lebanon, in the eastern Baqa Valley, and as you said, uh, in uh, an area north of Beirut uh, that hasn't really seen many strikes. It saw one strike uh, a few days ago, which people thought was perhaps an accident. But the the strike we saw today was it was much more deliberate. There's a very small Shiite community uh, near uh, uh, Jebel, which is a mostly Christian town, and that seems to have been uh, targeted. Uh, so that's provoked um, a lot of kind of you know, fear among those uh, living in the northern part of Lebanon who thought they might remain out of the fighting and uh, they, the, where they're living might remain safer. Uh, again, the, the death toll has uh, gone up, 51 dead a day. It's not uh, anything like the sort of numbers we saw on the first day. Is that a sign that um, Israel is pulling back uh, its strikes. Uh, it's not clear yet, uh, but uh, again, it's a big day, loss of life again for Lebanon. Sure, and, and we're obviously we're talking about people continuing to flee uh, the south of Lebanon, uh, where they're deemed to be in harm's way. What sort of places are they going to, and are provisions being made for them by the authorities? Sure. So um, about 90,000 people are newly displaced, according to the UN. That's on top of 110,000 people who were already displaced uh, by the last year of fighting between Hezbollah and Israel. So people are, are spreading out around the country. People are going to um, cities still in the south, like in Saida, because uh, that's the first place they were able to reach, particularly you know, if they were injured or uh, they didn't really have anywhere else to go. Uh, people uh, arrived in Beirut uh, shortly before there was a Another strike on the southern suburbs, uh, which again you know, has provoked a lot of fear among people who are like looking for a, a safe sanctuary. Um, and people are, and many of these people are there. They're arriving at uh, schools that have been repurposed into shelters. So they're not, uh, you know, they don't have. structure. OK, it looks like uh, we've got a bit of an audio issue there with uh, Beirut. Uh, speaking to our correspondent, 
uh, Hannah McCarthy there in Beirut seems uh, the situation there the, uh, is no doubt having an impact on uh, communications with the country. Well, let's uh, move on and let's get perspective from the Israeli side of the border now. We can cross the Tel Aviv and speak to our correspondent there, Sarah Coates. Sarah, just tell us what's the latest on the ground there in Israel? Hey there, Tom. It is an extremely tense situation on the ground as the region is really on the cusp of a wider scale conflict. Now, it was 6.30 a.m. local time today that air raid sirens began ringing out in the centre of Israel right here in Tel Aviv. We had notifications on our phones saying, get to shelter now. This was a surface to surface missile that was claimed by Hezbollah, fired by Hezbollah, intercepted by the David Sling missile defence system. And this missile was aimed, according to Hezbollah, at the Mossad headquarters in Herzliya. That's not very far from where I'm standing. And this was, according to Hezbollah, retaliation for these walkie-talkie and also pager attacks inside Lebanon last week. But once again, another major escalation, really bringing this region to the brink. Yeah, and so we've heard quite a bit of fairly alarming rhetoric, I think it's fair to call it, coming from uh, Israeli officials. Just give us a little summary of what we've been hearing today. We certainly are a number of different officials. One of the latest lines we've got is from the IDF Chief of Staff, Herzi Halevi. He's been with soldiers who are drilling in these northern communities, telling them to prepare to enter Lebanon. He said that the military is preparing for a ground offensive against Hezbollah. He said that Israel has upped its attack since this surface-to-surface -surface missile was fired at the centre of the country early this morning. And we do need to add that the military has also called up two reserve brigades to this northern region. So very worrying signs on the ground. But when you look at it in terms of uh, who might have what, of course Israel has the advantage when it comes to these aerial attacks that have been going on now for three days. But if Israel were to enter Lebanon in the ground, on the ground, this would be a very, very different story. And it's a situation uh, that people do know would be catastrophic and would likely have very, very high death tolls on both sides of this border, Tom. And sorry, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is supposed to be uh, in New York tomorrow, Thursday, to attend the uh, UN General Assembly. I I'm just wondering, is this trip likely to go ahead? And if it does, what might we expect to hear from him? Yeah, we are hearing now that this uh, does seem likely to go ahead. That's according to a number of Israeli officials. We do understand that the foreign minister, Israel Katz, is likely to step into the role of Benjamin Netanyahu if he does fly out as planned tomorrow. Now, he'll be taking with him, according to a number of sources, hostage families, uh, people who've lost loved ones in Gaza and also family members of people who are still being held there. But this is expected to be a very, very different reception for the Israeli Prime Minister compared to what happened last year. He gave an address really sort of touting a new era in the Middle East. But this year, if he does go, he's expected to be met with protests, met with walkouts. And what we potentially could expect to hear from Benjamin Netanyahu really is the threat of Iran. He's expected to rally the global community, saying that basically Israel is fighting this war in Gaza, fighting this battle on the northern front, on behalf of the West, really uh, nailing down once again, if we, as we've heard from him so many times, about the threat of Iran in the region. But still, not 100% as to whether this trip will go ahead. But if it does, uh, not going to be a very warm welcome, I suspect. All right. Well, thank you very much indeed for bringing us all the latest from Tel Aviv. Sarah Coates, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's get some more perspectives. And I'm joined now by the spokesperson for the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, or 
Unifil, as they're better known. Andrea Tenenti, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, Unifil's got 10,500 peacekeepers there in Lebanon. And of course, there's a very fast moving situation. And I'm just wondering how the role of the peacekeepers is adapting to the current reality. Yes, the, the role of the 10,500 uh, peacekeepers from 50 uh, different countries has been adapting uh, in the last uh, 12 months to the situation uh, on the ground. And we have been uh, continuing to monitor uh, patrolling supporting the lebanese army trying to deconflict the situation along the blue line but also assisting uh, local communities of course in these days the situation in the last three or four days has been uh, uh, more challenging with uh, some of the heaviest uh, exchanges of fire and shelling uh, especially into lebanon that uh, that we have seen in the last uh, 11 months so it's been more difficult to be operational but uh, uh, the head of mission of Unifil uh, General uh, Lazaro has been in touch with the parties. He kept uh, this open channel of communications with both sides in order to uh, de-escalate uh, uh, the situation and uh, and also in trying to uh, defuse some of the tension. The things, that, of course, the situation is very very uh, challenging, and uh, and we have been saying from 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 quite some times, and in these days even more vocal that uh, if uh, this these exchanges, these uh, hostilities are still continuing. Uh, the potential for a wider conflict or the regional conflict uh, uh, will be just around the corner and there will be catastrophic consequences for everyone, not only for the two countries. Yeah, I mean, I was just looking at the UNIFIL mandate uh, and one of the stated goals is to confirm the withdrawal of Israeli forces from the south of Lebanon. And I'm just wondering what happens if Israel starts a ground invasion? Would your role, would, would the role of UNIFIL be to stop them? Of course, UNIFIL is here under Resolution 1701. UNIFIL has been here in 2006 also. We did not leave uh, during the 34 days of war, even when uh, Israeli uh, were inside Lebanese territories. We have been here since 1978. So if there is a, a situation or conditions that would not allow the mission to be operational at all, of course, the Security Council, we need to decide. But at the moment, we are really focusing on deconflicting the situation and, uh, and the solution is there. The solution is the full implementation of uh, Resolution 1701 that both countries have accepted. 1701 has also uh, stopped the conflict in, uh, in 2006. So we need to go back to that. We need to go back to the implementation of 1701, more Lebanese army in the south, uh, solving all the issues along the blue line because there is no border between the two countries, uh, having an area free of weapons, uh, uh, only the weapons and the presence of the Lebanese army. But of course, for that, you need commitment. Uh, you need uh, uh, also the, the support from the international community like we are having now, international community trying to uh, decrease and diffuse the tensions, especially in these days in the General Assembly in New York with the wide number of uh, diplomats trying to uh, discuss this issue as one of the priorities. So just uh, zooming in on the issue of the Lebanese army, because I'm, 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 I'm curious to know what their role is when you've got a situation like the situation we have now, where there's a state within the state, which is Hezbollah, which has its own army, its own militants. Um, if we agree that the weapons that Hezbollah has in the south of Lebanon are a danger or they're putting uh, Lebanese national security in danger, isn't it the role of the Lebanese army, therefore, to get rid of those weapons and to try to do something about making sure uh, that uh, Israel doesn't come after them? Well, the, the, the role of the Lebanese army, of course, has been heavily challenged in, the, in, in this period and even before uh, for many different reasons, also financial reasons. And that's why it has been important uh, for the international community to focus on uh, increasing the capacities and capabilities of the Lebanese army. So the Lebanese army are uh, fully committed and they've been on the ground not only now, but even in the past during this serious financial crisis. So what we need is the, 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 the support from the international community to make the Lebanese army stronger and to make the Lebanese army more present in the south in order to have state authority back in the south of Lebanon. And when it comes to these weapons caches of, of Hezbollah in the south of Lebanon, have, has UNIFIL been involved in trying to find them? Is that part of the role or, or not, not, not specifically? 
Well, the role of the mission is to support the Lebanese army in ensuring there are no weapons in in, in the south of Lebanon. Of course, uh, uh, we've seen now that, and that's what I'm saying, that also 1701 has been heavily challenged uh, because of lack of, of implementation. Uh, uh, ground and air violations also are continuing. And so there are a lot of things that needs to be implemented. And so that's why I'm saying the 1701 has all the main provisions in order to do that. What it's missing is the implementation. We can open a window of opportunities for the parties to move forward in the implementation. The implementation is up to them. It's not up to, to the mission, but we're here to, uh, to assist. And that's why, as I said, uh, the, the, the implementation is key for a solution uh, in this region. We also have to think that before, to tell, before October last year, uh, the south of Lebanon had witnessed one of its quietest period in its recent history, 17 years of calm and stability. We need to go back to that and move forward. I know it's very challenging. I know that it's not an easy task, but we are prepared uh, to assist and support, uh, even with any kind of new agreement that could be found to stop this insanity of, uh, uh, of a conflict or hostilities that has been uh, destroying the region for the last uh, 12 months. I think I'm correct in saying that UNIFIL is, is respected and welcomed on the ground and the Lebanese people uh, appreciate the efforts made by UNIFIL. Uh, I'm just wondering, you, you mentioned their dialogue. Could, could UNIFIL have a role in, in, in any eventual dialogue? And, and do you have a line of communication with Hezbollah? We have a line of communication with the Lebanese authorities who, and with the Lebanese army that, of course, we speak to, to Hezbollah. Uh, we don't have a direct line of communication. We have a direct line with, with IDF. But this communication has been working in uh, uh, providing messages from one side to the others for the last uh, almost 12 months in order to de-escalate the tension. In these days, we need more of that, but we also need more uh, main stakeholders to work on proper uh, negotiations. We don't have a political uh, mandate. We are here to implement and uh, and to support the implementation of a mandate. But we need, of course, also the support, and everyone needs the support of main uh, stakeholders to, to try to find solution to this uh, to these hostilities. Okay, well, we wish you all the best. Uh, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us. Unifil spokesman Andrea Tenenti, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Let's turn to the United States now, and in a boost to her campaign, the Democratic presidential hopeful Vice President Kamala Harris has been given the endorsement of one of the biggest Muslim American voter mobilization groups. Engage Action says that it backs Harris and called it a responsibility to ensure that Donald Trump is defeated in November. Well, both presidential candidates are in battleground states today. Harris is in Pennsylvania. Trump is in North Carolina, where he's been outlining his plans to protect workers if he returns to the White House. Well, our very own Kate Fisher filed this report. Pennsylvania is key to both Harris and Trump's path to the White House. It's the swing state with the largest number of electoral college votes. Harris is set to deliver what aides are describing as a major address on the economy. That's the biggest issue for voters in the election. She's expected to describe her economic philosophy as pragmatic and not bound by ideology. And she'll also discuss new manufacturing initiatives. Trump, meanwhile, touted his economic plans in another swing state, Georgia, on Tuesday, saying that he would reward US-based manufacturers with tax breaks. Under my leadership, we are going to take other countries' jobs. Did you ever hear that expression before? Have you ever heard that we're going to take other countries' jobs? It's never been stated before. We're going to take their factories, and we had it really rocking four years ago. We're going to bring thousands and thousands of businesses and trillions of dollars in wealth back to the good old USA. That's what we're going to, we're going to be doing it and doing it fast. Today, Trump's due back in North Carolina after he held a rally in the state at the weekend. A new Elon University YouGov poll puts Vice President Harris one point ahead of him in the state, and that's well within the margin of error, but it still shows that the race has tightened there since Harris became the Democratic nominee. 
Meanwhile, Donald Trump's campaign says that the former president has been briefed by US intelligence officials about possible assassination plots from Iran. The Trump team says the briefing included details about real and specific threats from Iran to assassinate the former president, something that the campaign said was an effort to destabilise and sow chaos in the US. Iranian threats have reportedly heightened in the past few months. Trump warned on Truth Social, that's his social media platform, that Iran would likely try again in its efforts. It all comes as a report into the attempt on his life in July at a rally in Pennsylvania found that the Secret Service had made a, quote, series of foreseeable and preventable mistakes. Investigators also found that Secret Service personnel have since deflected blame as a result of their responsibilities not being clearly defined ahead of the rally. Kate Fisher, Al Arabiya News, Washington. OK, well, for more, I'm joined here in the studio by the chair of Republicans Overseas UK, Greg Swenson. Very good to have you with us good here on Al Arabiya News once again. Thanks for coming in. Um, more details are coming in about what happened on the 13th of July. It's been dubbed the worst secret security failure in decades. And I'm talking, of course, yeah. about that assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Then on the 15th of September, there's that attempt on the golf course. And now we've got this uh, message that was put out by uh, Donald Trump overnight saying, quote, uh, big threats on my life by Iran. What, what do we know about that? It's been out for a while, actually. It's, um, you know, I, I was talking about it in July at the convention and, and shortly thereafter. And, and they, were, you know, they basically put hits on not only Donald Trump, but Mike Pompeo, Robert O'Brien, former, na former national security advisor. So you know, this is a pretty blatant threat from Iran. And, and I think intelligence has picked it up, but I think in many ways they brag about it, too. So and it, you know, if, I don't think the response has been there from the Biden administration. They've sort of continued to appease Iran on so many metrics. And, and if you look back at 1993, when the, when the uh, attempt on George H.W. Bush was made public, Bill Clinton, even though he was an opposition party, you know, he sent the bombers into Iraq. So I think that's the kind of threat we're not seeing from the Biden administration. And this isn't, of course, the first time we've heard about Tehran somehow trying to interfere in the 2024 presidential election, is it? No, it's not. And I think you'll see more of it. So, you know, th this is something that, you know, appeasement's never going to work here. I think there's got to be some demonstration of strength from the Biden administration. Throughout the last week or so, throughout this bulletin this evening, we've been very focused on developments in the Middle East, in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Israel. Um, in your view, what would change with regards to Middle Eastern policy were Donald Trump to take back the White House? It's hard to predict because President Trump is so unpredictable. But I think if you just look at, make it a referendum on two administrations. What you had in the Trump administration was peace and prosperity. You had the Abraham Accords. You had the movement of the, of the embassy to Jerusalem. He was a friend of Israel. That was clear. And I don't think you're seeing that clarity from the Biden administration. So, you know, four years ago, it was relatively peaceful in the world and, and in the Middle East. And now we have a lot of volatility and a lot of uncertainty. So I think it's just the, the way to look at it is make it a referendum on two administrations. Will you know, Trump replicate the exact strategy he had during his first administration? Probably, but you know, I can't guarantee it. But, but I, again, I think if you just look at the two and the outcomes, not just the policies. When it comes to foreign policy, I mean, do you think all world leaders want someone unpredictable? Don't they want an element of predictability? I, I think that's helpful, you know, and I think that's one of the challenges with President Trump. But on the other hand, our adversaries are a bit afraid of unpredictability. And, and what we've seen in the last three and a half years is really the, the largest decline in U.S. influence since perhaps since the 1930s. That's not a good sign. So I think from a foreign policy perspective, there's a reason that President Trump polls higher than both Biden and Harris in terms of you know, ability to protect the country, foreign policy. I mean, it's amazing. You, you always think of President Trump leading on inflation and the economy and the border crisis, but he's also leading on foreign policy. But the polls do suggest they're pretty much neck and neck. And when you look Absolutely. at the national polling averages, you're looking at a slight lead for 
Kamala Harris. I don't know if that's significant or not, because obviously it's all down to those swing states and the undecided voters. But what sort of evolution are you noting when you look at the polls every day or every week? Yeah, I, I, mean, I follow them every day, and I think you're, you're seeing trends. You surely don't have the meteoric rise of Kamala Harris during the re-imaging of her in, in late July and August. That was, that was where she went from Biden's enthusiasm numbers in the 30s to you know, hers in the 60s. However, she leveled off. And since then, we've had, you know, good week for Kamala, good week for Trump the next week. You know, so it's very tight, as you pointed out. Her, the fact that she's up one and a half to two points nationally, A, it doesn't matter because, of, you know, it's all about the swing states and the Electoral College. And B, she's actually not leading as much as Hillary was in 2016, nor President Biden was in 2020. So I think that's a good sign for Trump. But e even admitting that, it, it's going to be really close. Uh, on Tuesday, we've got the two vice presidential hopefuls yep. who are going to go uh, head to head in a televised debate, J.D. Vance, Tim Waltz. Um, that's the last televised debate of the campaign, isn't it? Yep. And I'm just wondering why Vance is trailing in the polls, in your opinion. Yeah, I think, that, I mean, look, the press obviously doesn't like him, and they don't, as, as they don't particularly like President Trump either. So, you know, you've got a, a rebranding of Kamala and complete support from the legacy media, I would call it activist media in the U.S. That's helping both Tim Waltz and Kamala Harris. But if you look at the details, um, J.D. Vance, I think, is a much better, uh, he's much better at articulating the message than President Trump is. So I think he's been surprisingly good on the campaign trail, on the stump. And the other thing I would like to point out is Tim Waltz, when he was nominated by Kamala Harris, her numbers went down five points in Minnesota. You know, so she went from up 10 to up five. And Tim Waltz is, you know, governor of the state where that's number five in the nation for people leaving the state and moving to red states. So I'm not sure it's a great indicator for Tim Waltz. J.D. Vance has, has done a good job in spite of it being slightly controversial. He's doing a good job articulating the message. And we often hear that the, the media doesn't like Donald Trump. The media doesn't like J.D. Vance uh, as someone from the media. Right. I mean, I would counter that by saying, isn't it the job of people seeking high office to make the media like them? Not just, well, not just the media, but the, the, the voting public as well. That is part of I, their job. I agree, Tom. That's one of the challenges for the Trump campaign. He still manages to top out at 47%. He is polarizing. And I've always argued there's been media bias against Republicans. But it's turned, you know, A, you have to just face that and, and deal with it and try to appeal. And B, it's turned from kind of biased into activism. And I think that's what's troubling a lot of Republicans in the U.S. right now, is it's, it's a really activist media. And, you, you know, no interviews. And granted, that's probably the, by design from the Kamala Harris campaign. But no interviews, no hard questions from the press, no press conferences. So I, I just wish they were a little bit more curious about her policies and about some of Tim Waltz's policies that have done real damage to Minnesota. So just talking there about the vice presidential debate, what about round two of the presidential debate? Do you think we're going to see, I mean, I know Donald Trump said he won't have another debate against yeah. Kamala Harris, but do you think he'll um, perhaps surprise everyone? He could. You know, I think he, if he does, he has to do a better job. I mean, he, I think it was a real missed opportunity for President Trump. And I think the consensus is quite obvious that in terms of the actual debate, Kamala Harris did a better job. She had a good night. She was on form. She was well rehearsed. In fact, perhaps too rehearsed. But I think that President Trump, I wish that he wanted another chance and could be a little bit more disciplined the second time around. Will it happen? I'm not sure. I th I'm not sure they can agree to terms. I think, you know, many of us on the right were disappointed with ABC and the way they fact check uh, Trump many times and, and didn't fact check Kamala on, on several they, of her. They would argue that was because he needed fact checking. Yeah, well, I think Kamala Harris did too. I'm not defending Trump's uh, hyperbole that, that, that was often checked, but I think there were several from Kamala Harris that were quite obvious. You know, the Charlottesville hoax, you know, saying that there were no American servicemen and women in harm way. I mean, th those were kind of easy. Even I could pick those up as I was watching it. Um, do you think another debate would change something? I'm not sure it would. And, and I think if you look at President Trump, he's not great at debates. I think he's better in the town hall style debate. But, you know, he clearly wasn't up to making the argument the way that I would like to have seen him. And I, I also think that on reflection, people looked, you know, on second, you know, the day two or day three, started to look at it and say, okay, Trump definitely missed an opportunity and it wasn't a great night for him. But 
Kamala Harris didn't really say much. And I think people, the voters are starting to see through that. That's why she did not get a bump, in spite of winning, you know, 53 to 38 was one of the numbers I saw in terms of, you know, who won the debate. And yet she didn't get a bump from the debate. She didn't get a bump from the convention either. So she got a huge bump in late July and August. And, and perhaps it's because they ran a perfect campaign of re-imaging her. So I think you'll see a, a, an electorate that looks at Trump's record and Trump's policies, which are much better than Kamala's record and Kamala's policies, versus this great re-imaging they've done. And, and good for them, because it's really helped in the polls. And of course, the the Democrat ballot harvesting machine, which really did well in 2020 and 22. I hope the Republicans do better at that this time. This is Donald Trump's last chance, isn't it? He's not going to, he's not going to run again, is he? This is I would, the, I would hope not. He'll, he'll be 83 in 2028. I don't think we need more 80 year old candidates. So yeah, this is the last chance for him. Okay. Greg Swenson, the chair of Republicans overseas UK. Thank you very much. Thanks Tom. Good to be here. Thank you. Let's get a check of some business news stories we're following for you now. And in its latest OECD report, that body has raised the forecast for the world economy this year. The Paris-based organization says global GDP is set to expand by 3.2%. That's up very slightly on the previous forecast. Uh, the OECD cited growth in the US, Brazil, the UK, India and Indonesia for that uptake. Though Germany, Japan and Argentina are all continuing to struggle. Unions in Germany are threatening strike action at Volkswagen. This says uh, Europe's biggest automaker mulls layoffs and plant closures. Well, union reps are vowing to fight the job cuts and blame senior management at Volkswagen for the company's struggles, which also come in the face of fierce competition from cheaper Chinese manufacturers. And uh, the US Department of Justice has filed an antitrust lawsuit against Visa. After a three-year-long probe, they accused the company of having an illegal monopoly over the use of debit cards in the US. And that, they say, has enabled the company to generate billions of dollars in additional fees from US businesses and consumers. Well, Visa refutes those claims. A reminder of our top stories, Lebanon's health minister Firas Abiyad says that at least 51 people have been killed, 223 others have been injured as a result of Israeli airstrikes. Israeli media is reporting that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is convening a cabinet meeting after the military intercepted heavy missile fire from Hezbollah, which targeted a civilian area of Tel Aviv. Plus, in the US election, Donald Trump's campaign says that intelligence is warning of fresh Iranian assassination threats. And Kamala Harris, meanwhile, has received the endorsement of the top US Muslim voter organization. Well, that is all we have time for. Coming up next is Riz Khan. And at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, do join my colleague Rosanna Lockwood for Global News Today with her special guest, the Lebanese health minister, Dr. Firas Abiyat. <laughs>